fitting to start a series on bioethics with a discussion of one of the major health issues of our times. The scourge of AIDS is not just a health issue, it is a painful personal tragedy for millions of people and their families, and it affects the very core and stability of many nations. We're fortunate indeed to have John McGoldrick with us tonight to talk about the challenges this pandemic brings and how the world community is addressing them. Mr. McGoldrick is a lawyer whose career has had him dealing in a variety of ways with medical issues. A graduate of Harvard and Harvard Law School, he was until his retirement in 2006 Executive Vice President and General Counsel for Bristol Myers Squibb. He serves now as Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Zimmer Company, uh, which is a major medical uh, company, and he recently created with the Harvard School of Public Health a fellowship program to train African scientists in advanced biostatistics. That left me wondering how he also managed to chair the Princeton Borough Zoning Board for 20 years. But the McGoldricks have been Princeton residents and committed community citizens for the past 40 or so years. Anne McGoldrick even had the dubious pleasure of being president of the school board for several years. The zoning board, the school board, and AIDS, what are they thinking of? As senior vice president of the International AIDS Vaccine Insti Initiative, John McGoldrick is in a good position to open our series, Bioethics and its Impact on Our Lives, with a discussion of a vaccine to end AIDS, ethical challenges of a historic pandemic. John? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Um, and a special thanks to the person who got this computer working. Uh, <clears throat> let me first see if we can uh, pull it fully up here. Uh, all right. Um, <clears throat> I, I should say uh, it's nice, very nice of Nancy to uh, make uh, those remarks. I, uh, but, but lest I be thought a complete fraud here, my full-time job is not with Zimmer, which is a maker of artificial hips and knees, which is a wonderful thing, but got nothing to do with AIDS. Uh, my full-time job is with the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, which I. Uh, <coughs> Uh, started in about three years ago, when to my astonishment I turned 65 and had to retire from Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, where I had also been quite involved with the epidemic, uh, from a different philanthropic perspective there. Um, so tonight, here's what I propose to do. Uh, take maybe about a third of the time, and that would be the challenge, to to give you some kind of grounding in the HIV epidemic and the search for a vaccine. Second, the second part is uh, really to try to address, although I'll touch on them in the first part, uh, a series of ethical issues which this field uh, brings. Um, <clears throat> and then third, a uh, question and answer period which uh, I, I hope and let you get at whatever you're interested in uh, in this subject. Uh, so uh, let's start with the state of the epidemic. Before, before I do, I should say a couple of things. For those of you who don't know the field, numbers in the field, I should say very accurate numbers, are very hard to come by. Uh, much of it is estimation, good estimation, but estimation nonetheless. So if you read uh, uh, even the newspapers or uh, <clears throat> literature in the field, you'll find the numbers varying and it's occasionally disconcerting. I know but it is to me. Um, but that's just the way things are and uh, you will occasionally see numbers if you know the field that might, might not seem exactly right. But they're all within uh, a range that is um, perfectly sufficient for anything we're talking about tonight. Secondly, I, I assume that in the room tonight are people who know very little about HIV AIDS and people who know a fair amount, uh, possibly more than I do. And so what I'm going to try to do is capture the middle ground where I'm not uh, dumbing it down too much for those who know more, but not 
carrying it on, particularly in the science, at a level which is going to miss a lot of people. We'll see, and you'll judge whether I get that, get, get that calibration right. Finally, with respect to the ethical issues uh, I'll go to, uh, there really are a great many here. We could probably take an evening on each one, or at least many of them, and we don't have time to do that, uh, certainly. Uh, so there are a number of things which I'm not going to touch on in my remarks, and when we get to Q&A, anything is fair game. Uh, I'm happy to uh, at least try to answer whatever you bring to me then. But, but note that there are some things which, such as what one hears about all the time, uh, <clears throat> which relate to the epidemic, which uh, present interesting uh, ethical issues, certainly those on which people differ, uh, with respect to, for example, the United States' role in providing uh, aid uh, in the epidemic, and yet holding back from uh, full aid when it comes to counseling about condoms, about availability of abortion, and those sorts of things. Perfectly reasonable issue. I'm not going to spend much time on it. If you want to come back to it, fine. I also won't spend any time on animal rights issues, which, um, of course, one hears about not only with respect to vaccine research, but drug research in general. Uh, there are others. So it's a selected set of issues. Come back to any that you would like to. Uh, so let's uh, dive right in to the epidemic itself. These are the topics I propose to cover. I'm going to watch the clock because I want to be sure we do not um, miss the question and answer part. <clears throat> so most of you will probably know this rough history. In 1982, uh, we discovered that this phenomenon, AIDS, uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, which was killing people, um, was related to a virus. Before that, we didn't know what was causing it. We weren't quite sure what it was. Um, actually, the virus probably jumped from a different primate form to humans as far back we now know, at least till uh, the late 19th century. Um, but we really didn't start to have a, a real epidemic for reasons, a variety of reasons, which are mostly of historical interest, until uh, the late 70s and early 80s. From the period of 1982 to roughly 1995, HIV-AIDS was a death sentence. Uh, you might live longer, you might live shorter, but you would die. Uh, we simply had no way to stop that progression. One goes through the natural course of the disease, as you probably know, is a period during which uh, you seem to be fine. Your immune system is fighting off the virus, which is in your body, tamping it down. Uh, but there comes a point uh, when the virus wins out. It's inexorable. It happens at different rates in different people. Um, when I say it's an we're going to come back to that, because that's not strictly true, and it's very important. Uh, but for the most part, it's true. <clears throat> uh, and that was the world until about the early 1990s. At that point, drugs became available, but they were imperfect. They were good drugs, but they really didn't solve the problem. It was only with the advent of highly active antiretroviral therapy, HEART, uh, around 1995, that we found a way to control the disease. In places like the United States and much of the rich world, the developed world, we found a way to uh, <clears throat> make the disease really a morbid condition, lifetime, uh, rather than a mortal condition. With therapy cocktails of drugs. And of course, you know examples of people, perhaps in your own lives, uh, but certainly people in the public uh, sphere who live quite successfully and pretty much uh, normal life expectancies. We don't have enough data to really know that yet, uh, but pretty much. Um, 
And the drugs are no fun, and they have to be changed every roughly 12 months because the virus mutates around them. Uh, and oh, many of them have side effects, some of them not happy at all. But you can, you can live, and you can live a relatively normal life. For reasons I'm not going to be able to go into it in depth tonight, that is not the case in the developing world. And it's not because of the unavailability of drugs. It was originally. But rather because there is a whole healthcare infrastructure which we just take for granted uh, that is simply not available in much of the developing world, certainly in much of rural Africa. Uh, so that is a huge difference, which we may come back to a little bit. So that's the rough timeline. And the next question is, when do we have a vaccine? We don't have one. We've been trying for 25 years in some degree or other. Um, and we're not going to have one tomorrow. When will we have one? I'll start with that answer. Everyone asks that question. And the answer is, we just don't know. All right. But what do we know? We know enough that probably an intelligent judgment is we're not likely to have a vaccine to put into people's lungs, at least for another decade. It may be 20 years. It's probably somewhere in that range. And it could be more. And that means scores of millions of lives. So finding a vaccine is key. <clears throat> here. So I'm going to start with some numbers uh, just to quickly set the status of the epidemic. 33 million people living with HIV today, uh, 23 million or, t or so dead. They're not in the 33 million, of course. We have 7,500 new infections daily. It's often not recognized that women bear clearly the brunt of the epidemic, uh, half of all worldwide and 60% in Africa. Um, and it appears, this is very murky stuff, that we could be getting to rates of deaths around 5 million, 2005, this is an old slide, uh, 10 million by uh, 2030. The virus. A very important point is the virus is gaining on us. We, we do see some leveling of rates of increase, but the virus is still winning the battle. Do that again. The only thing I want you to look at in this slide is the dark blue line. The rest of it's interesting, but not for tonight. The dark blue line simply shows the rate at which this epidemic has been increasing. It's still increasing. Uh, it's going to increase at least for a while, and maybe indefinitely, at least at some rate. This is a particularly powerful slide to me. It picks out a series of African countries of relatively high rates of infection. And it, the slide itself tries to predict what the um, life expectancy is going to be in 2010. Uh, with uh, AIDS, which we, a world we live in, and what it would be without AIDS. But this isn't just a future prediction. Taking Botswana, the most severely affected country to your right, left, I should say, um, <clears throat> Botswana has already seen life expectancy of children born today go from 70 low 70s uh, a few years ago, down into around 30. What, what an incredible change in society. Uh, there are societies in Africa, nations in Africa, which genuinely, this is not, this is a, a sober analysis, I believe, uh, which can be destroyed by this epidemic. Uh, <clears throat> this, the only important thing to take away from this slide is that it, the epidemic has huge economic impact. Most of the countries most affected have been growing at very good rates of, of increase of GDP. 
uh, they were from low bases, but they were growing at rates of 10, 8 to 10 percent. Um, this tries to plot, it's a model, tries to plot what an additional percentage or five percentiles of um, prevalence rate does to an economy year in, year out. And if you're drawing your economy one additional percent per year, uh, that's a huge difference. It has a big economic impact. The, the part that just came up here is the best estimate given by UNAIDS, which is really the definitive um, keeper of statistics in the field, um, that if we succeeded in doing what we shall surely not succeed in doing, and that is treating everyone who needed to be treated by 2015, the cost would be around $54 billion a year. $54 billion this last couple of weeks doesn't seem like much, perhaps, uh, nor may it if you look at your 401k. But uh, the, um, the, the, the point is that's an immense number to, for the developed world to be primarily putting the bill for year in, year out. A way to look at it is if you took all of the aid to developed, developing countries and took uh, AIDS aid as uh, a piece of it, you'd find by 2010, and we're really effectively there, that a third of all the uh, aid that's sent is going for this. Uh, the numbers as of 2015 are at 50% at, at and think of that for a minute. That means all the aid that goes for clean water programs, for agriculture programs, for road building programs, for education, for the whole, the whole panoply down to food uh, is, has been will be halved unless we increase aid by a very substantial proportion which has its own uh, burdens. So that's my attempt to just give you a quick look at the state of the epidemic. Um, and I want to say a word before I go into a quick look at the virus itself. Numbers numb, especially do big numbers numb. It's very hard for us to get our arms around what 33 million people is, what it would look like. It's, it's some, you, you can make all kinds of analogies. It still doesn't work very well. It's the, it's the population of New York, London, Mumbai, Johannesburg, and three or four other cities. Um, actually, that, that's not right. That's a lower number. Uh, in any event, it's a huge number, but it's hard to really grasp. It's one of the reasons, I think, that most of the people who have become most passionate about this issue are people who have, one way or another, by accident or, or design, spent time in places where the epidemic is its worst, at its worst. That certainly happened to me. It's why I am where I am today. It's why I stand before you today, because I had uh, many, many uh, uh, chances to be up close and personal with the epidemic in Africa. And uh, the power of that is very difficult to express in the numbers, as clear and as logical a case as the numbers present. Um, when you do that, you, your mind is seared with memories of various sorts. And you carry them around. Uh, we don't have time for this sort of thing. but. Uh, for me, there are many. Uh, there's one particular one which always sticks out to me. It's a, a boy, uh, 11 years perhaps, very hard to tell his age, uh, real thin, um, very sick, dying clearly, gaunt, hollow-eyed, lacking any energy just standing by a door jam at a mission in a, a desolate, poverty-stricken place in northern Namibia. Yeah. I will never forget that. It is a photograph uh, I have in my brain, 
and I carry that kid around on my shoulders all the time. Uh, there are others, and those things are the real power of the epidemic, and he's one of 33 million people. Um, it, it, it's an extraordinary event, an historic event of our time. There are nice academic arguments about which is worse, this epidemic or the Black Plague, uh, and um, it, it's a really a silly argument in a way. I, I can argue both sides of that. I'm a lawyer after all. Um, but uh, it's certainly of that dimension. And, and worse, and remember, this isn't over. So let's turn for a minute to the virus itself. If you'll excuse me, I think it's helpful to understand the ethical issues, to have at least a little grounding in what's going on here. <clears throat> so uh, let's just pause at this for a minute. This cartoon attempts to show uh, a little bit of the life cycle, a part of the life cycle of the HIV virus. This orange part is a, is a representation of a human cell, a cell in your body, one cell. Uh, and these uh, uh, pink things with blue buttons on them are a, an outsized representation of what a, a virus uh, and, and individually you may know it's called a virion, uh, uh, how it interacts with the cell. So what it does, it's out here in the extracellular uh, space. It then, you, you see a representation here of it hooking on and fusing to the cell wall of this cell. Uh, at that point, it deposits into the cell its genetic material, which is RNA, uh, and a number of proteins, enzymes, which, which are needed to pursue its life cycle in the cell. And a bunch of things occur, I'm not going to go through them all, but the heart of it is that eventually a part of the RNA from the virus is converted to DNA, and DNA, the DNA becomes part of the DNA in the nucleus of the human cell. In short, in a way, the DNA becomes you. I mean, the, the, the virus becomes you, I should say, uh, because it has become part of your very DNA, which controls all of what you are and do. Um, eventually, and it may be immediately, uh, the virus effectively hijacks the machinery of the cell and uses the cell's own machinery to reproduce. And that happens to another series of stages, which I'm not going to go through here, ultimately resulting in the creation of a, to excuse the phrase, a baby uh, HIV, uh, which then buds out at the cell wall and off into the uh, cellular space. OK. Now, Try to keep that in your head as we go along because some of this becomes quite important to what we're doing. A day in the life of the virus by the numbers. What you just saw not only happens, but it happens in profound and rapid numbers. Um, one virion entering one cell will bud out a thousand new copies of itself in 20 minutes. The lifespan of the virus is about a day, day and a half. At steady state, that's not all the time, but it's part of the time, uh, when there's an equilibrium between the bodies killing the viruses off and the virus growing, uh, <clears throat> about 10 billion new copies are created a day. And at steady state, 10 billion die. But it's a huge number. The last one is actually the most important and the most remarkable. Because in that 24-hour period, the DNA, and the DNA is huge. It's an immense number of base pairs. Uh, and it is so even in a very simple organism like uh, HIV. Uh, but HIV is very sloppy. It makes mistakes all the time. Mutations occur, changes in the DNA occur uh, all the time. 
For most creatures, that's a horrible thing. If you, have, you do have mutations all the time, but you have them in small numbers. If you had mutations in large numbers, this would be awful for you. Most mutations are bad for most organisms, us included. Uh, for, for HIV, that's its genius. Because since it's changing all of the time, the defenses that the body is putting up against it, it can mutate around. And those, those mutants who uh, have the characteristic to avoid the body, or to avoid a drug, or to avoid a vaccine, uh, are the ones that survive and proliferate at this great volume we see. Now, this one's a lot, a lot is here as well. Try, I know it's hard to block most of it out of your mind. I want you to concentrate on just one thing. First, the timeline. Notice we've got hours here in this first batch, days here, and then weeks and years for that part. The key thing is that there is a small window of opportunity. Recent, this is pretty recent stuff, the last few years. And we, we're learning more every day. It appears that this may be hours. And what is it that I speak of? It's the period during which the HIV has crossed a mucosal barrier of one sort in the body or other, and then uh, integrates into a human cell, and then starts the process I just talked about. During that period of time, if you have enough of a defense in the body, uh, you might be able to fend it off. But it's a very short period of time when you can do that. Uh, after that, it is seeded. It's seeded. It's integrated into your DNA, and it becomes much harder. You probably have the infection for life. Maybe, maybe we can get a vaccine which can keep mopping up and, and keeping them down for your lifetime. But that's a whole lot harder thing than fending it off at the beginning. So if we're going to have a truly preventive vaccine, it's got a very narrow window of time. Um, this is relevant, but perhaps tangentially. I just love it because I find it so interesting. It depicts. The, the multicolors depict this huge variety that occurs by reason of the mutations in, in HIV. So these are different moons, actually, of different types of DNA in the, quote, donor, the person who is infecting somebody else. There is a period right there where the infection occurs. At that point, interestingly enough, only one uh, strain with one set of DNA uh, and in very small numbers uh, forms the basis for the infection in the person to be infected. And for a while it remains that way, but it speeds up and eventually reaches the viral diversity itself. Uh, we may come back to that in a minute. That's a, an attempt to give you a quick look at the virus and some features of it. I'm, for those of you who know this field, you will know I am skipping over a lot to try to give a taste. So let's go, actually, let me uh, go back here a uh, step. Um, no, we can leave this up. Because I, I, I want to make a point, uh, which we can come back to. But there are technical ethical issues. I mean, really technical bioethical questions relating to clinical trials, for example, which we'll come to. But there are some macro issues that I think are ethical as well. You might choose to call them moral public policy or morally tinged public policy issues, but they're really ethical issues. And some of them are huge. One of them is the obvious one. What are the ethical duties of the rich world, the North world, when you have an epidemic with scores of millions of people dying, 
that is controlled, not, not beaten off, but controlled uh, to a reasonable degree in the developing world, and not in the developed world, um, what is the duty? Is there a duty? Um, I think we can have a pretty long discussion about that. I mean, there are foreign policy reasons, probably, why the rich countries should be trying to help the poorer countries with this epidemic. But there are diplomatic reasons. There are economic reasons. But I put those aside, whatever they may be, however they come, to ask the question, uh, should your, should your foreign policy with respect to this kind of situation, well, this isn't about dollars. This is about lives. It's about dollars, too, but it's about lives. Uh, and uh, so, so what duty is there? Is there one? Maybe there isn't. Maybe, maybe that has to, if we do something, it has to come from another place. But uh, it's a big issue. Uh, and one that's worth talking about. A lot of what I'll do tonight probably is flag your questions. I have points of view on them, um, but they're questions as to which uh, at least reasoned arguments can be made on both sides, I suppose. Um, so let's, let's go to uh, the VH vaccine. Now, because that raises another ethical question before we go into this slide. The, this, the first one's a resource allocation issue, the, the big one I spoke of. This is also a resource allocation, and what is it? We're spending now around $15 billion a year as a world uh, on trying to, trying to deal with the, the epidemic in the developed world, developing world. Um, <clears throat> we spend about $900 million on vaccine work. Uh, some argue that we don't have a vaccine, we haven't had one for 25 years of trying. No one can stand before you and say, we certainly will have a vaccine. I will tell you we will have a vaccine. I'm, I'm convinced of it. But that's a lot of, uh, that can't be mathematically proved, certainly. And it is possible we will not have a vaccine, or we will not have it for a long time at 900 million a year uh, every year. So some argue that 900 million should be used to do whatever you can to increase the number of people you can treat. Uh, the drugs are essentially free, so the question is, you've got to use that money to build a whole healthcare system, to build economies. Daunting, daunting tasks, but $900 could do something. Uh, so the resource allocation issue there is raised by some and advanced. We who are in the vaccine business, I have a different point of view. We think you get much greater good for a greater number if you have a vaccine and we believe we can have a vaccine. And it's going to take a while. It's going to cost some money. But the money's tiny compared to the other expenditures and the long-term human impact. It's another ethical question, a resource allocation ethical question. So in, with that argument, what, what, is, what is the situation? Are we going to have a vaccine? Who says so? I stand before you and say so and don't have time for a long course on it. But what makes us think we will? Well, some things leap out. Uh, everyone who gets HIV, uh, has an immune system which fights the virus off, or not off, but keeps it down, so you're clinically free of disease. Not free of the virus, but free of disease. Because you know HIV doesn't kill you, it just, it just debilitates your immune system, so other things kill you. Um, so there's a period we fight it off, so the body's doing something, it's just not enough. So how do we take that another step? There is this curious matter of some populations being resistant to HIV infection. It's real. This is no longer subject to death. Small, small groups. But in Kangini, Nairobi, there are prostitutes who have had so many multiple exposures that it's statistically impossible for them not to be uh, infected. And they are not. So what is it about their constitution, their immune system, that's causing that? Um, 
there is perhaps an even more equally interesting set of cases with a, with a curious name uh, of people who are uh, called uh, non-progressors. They get infected, but instead of it taking three to eight years before their immune system is beaten down and they start to get sick and they need drugs, um, they, um, it doesn't happen until much later for them. And then there are the aid meat non-progressors. What a funny name. Uh, these people are now at, at periods which are as much as 25 years uh, of positive, being HIV positive, never having drugs, and never pers progressing to AIDS. They keep they have measurable levels of HIV, but they, it doesn't progress. Why? What about them? What, what, can we, what can we learn from that? It's very tantalizing. It's very suggestive. One thing I'm not going to talk to you at all today is animal models. No animals get HIV. Human is the only one. So there's no good animal model to test. That makes it very hard. That's fact. There are primates who get SIV, which is a, a primate version. Uh, it, it's similar. It's not the same. We can uh, vaccinate uh, Indian macaques uh, so that they don't get SIV. Uh, it's very similar. It's not the same. It's suggesting it's tantalizing. Uh, I've got to watch my time here because I want to be sure we get to uh, the ethical questions and the uh, Q&A. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to have to race through some of these and, even not, and not talk about some of them. This slide simply, if you can see it, um, simply shows that it's often taken a long time to get a vaccine. Now, true, our, our scientific sophistication in 1906 for pertussis was a whole lot less than it is today. On the other hand, it's taken us a long time to get HPV virus uh, for cervical cancer. We still don't have malaria virus, uh, excuse me, I said a virus, I mean a vaccine uh, for malaria. And so maybe the 25 years isn't such a long time, at least compared to other things, and HIV is a tough customer. I'm back here to this slide. If you're awake, you probably remember you saw it about seven slides ago. And uh, I bring it back for two reasons. This, these little red boxes here try to show that there are two arms of the immune system, arguably more than that, but two important ones. One, antibodies which neutralize a virus and work on the virus before it gets near the cell. And then there are cell mediated uh, forms of immunity involving things you've probably heard of at least, B cells, T cells, killer T cells, macrophages, a whole bunch of parts of a complicated immune system we have that go after in cells once they're infected. Uh, so they might come in and kill the cell that's the orange cell here, uh, your own cell that's got the virus in it as a way of killing the virus. Um, those are the two arms of the system. For a whole range of reasons, we really only have this one open pathway, this one open pipeline to a vaccine. We've been trying at Bandus to get a cell-mediated uh, vaccine to induce cell-mediated immunity. We think it's not enough. We think we need to have both it and neutralizing antibodies to really, really work. Uh, you need neutralizing antibodies to mount that first preventive role and then cell-mediated immunity to do the mop-up of the addition. At least that's the theory. We don't really know. What we do know is all our eggs have been in that basket. Why? Well, probably because that's the way we always did it. Fundamentally, with vaccines, we didn't know what we were doing. I speak of the world. Uh, what we knew is if we took a hunk of the bug that's bothering you and put it in through a needle 
your body would mount some kind of immune response and would remember it when that bug came back again. Uh, and that's how most of the vaccines you have had work. Um, we weren't sure what's going on. To this day, we're not really sure what's going on. We're much more sophisticated than the knowledge I just spoke. But uh, it's, it's a complicated business. But it was the easy way to do it. It's the way we always did it. Designing a neutralizing antibody, designing something that's going to cause neutralizing antibodies is much more difficult. Um, we're going to move along here. This slide is simply to show the remarkable degree to which um, HIV mutates in the body. Uh, this little sequence, ENV, it is part of the DNA of the virus which codes for the proteins uh, which will build the envelope, the skin of the virus. In that period of time, a DNA which was 77% alike becomes 7% alike, and that's probably the smallest in the whole batch. It's just um, shows you how rapidly this change occurs. Which brings me to another ethical question, which actually is quite an interesting one to me. I, I think the world has sort of come to a consensus as to what to do. But here it is. This is a map. It happened to be our clinical trial sites, my organization. There are others, uh, although we were pretty early in doing it. Uh, in Africa, in typically hard hit places uh, in Africa. Um, so if you knew anything about vaccinology, you'd say, why are you doing that? It's very hard to do vaccine trials in those regions. Lack of healthcare infrastructure, uh, a whole range of things missing in the healthcare systems that let us do clinical trials around the corner very, very much faster and often more reliably. Uh, so why not do it as fast as you can somewhere, Philadelphia, uh, and then, when you've got your vaccine, you can, you can take it to the world. Here's the problem with AIDS. That is, by the way, how many vaccines, many drugs are done. Uh, first in the developing world, you can go faster. That's ultimately going to be good for everyone in both the developed and the developing world. Uh, here's the problem with HIV. It's all that mutation. In big mutated groups, which are called clades, they share a lot. They still mutate within the clade. Um, big mutated, mutated groups, clades, circulate in parts of the world differently. So that in Southern Africa, clade C is the most common. In America, clade B is the most common. Uh, Here's what we don't know. We're trying to find a vaccine that would work against any clade, any of those variations. But how are we going to know? We're not going to know until we actually do the clinical trials. And if we do the clinical trials in the developing world first, and we then go to Africa and do them, we're going to find that we have to redo them, perhaps. It, it may not work there. So with so much of the epidemic in the developed, developing world, we came to the conclusion that we really needed to do the reverse of the norm and do clinical trials in uh, Africa first. Much harder to do, much more expensive, a whole lot of complications. But, but you could make a different argument. You could argue, I want speed, speed at all costs. Bet. Make a bet that when you get a vaccine, it's going to work in both places. That there's not a lot of evidence for that bet. There's not a lot of evidence the other way. So, so what do you do? Well, you can say you can do it in both places, and you can. Mark actually did that with the candidate they had, and credit to them. But it's, it, it has other complications, not to mention uh, expense. Um, 
So a minute on neutralizing antibodies, and that's all we can do. Um, this is another cartoon. So quickly, this is the, uh, the virus. This is a blow-up, this sector of the cell wall of the virus. This hunk of stuff is a, uh, that little button up there, because that's the thing that attaches to the cell. So here's what we found. There are human beings who have neutralizing antibodies broadly in the sense that they work against a lot of strains of HIV. And here they are. And we've characterized them. We've got photos of them on electron microscopy. Uh, we know what they are. We know where they fit. We also know that these four aren't good enough. They're produced by humans. They're effective in some cases, but they're not good enough. We need to get better ones than these. This is a very tough thing. It's, it's devilishly designed. Most of this is covered by, think, think of a tropical rainforest of a huge canopy. And you need to get down to very tiny places in the roots of a tree. And you can't do it because those trees and leaves are waving back and forth in the wind and, and keeping, literally physically, conformationally, keeping antibodies away. Uh, it, um, it's just one feature of this. Some of these are particularly difficult places to get at physically. Um, we're trying to find neutralizing antibodies. We've found some. This is just another, we won't take more time, but it's another way to look at that protrusion I spoke of. Uh, and it just shows you the places where those four antibodies actually do stick on. Uh, we now have, uh, there's a, uh, a single individual human being in the Ivory Coast who is called a super neutralizer. Uh, I don't know that that gets him much cachet in, in his hometown, but he's HIV positive, and more than any human we've ever seen, he produces a huge variety of neutralizing antibodies. We don't know yet. He's not yet on drugs. We don't know whether he'll need them. What we do know is we're trying to use all of his neutralizing antibodies to study to see if they look like they are going to work in volume. Not enough time. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> I think I'm going to have to skip this part. Sad to say, it's about uh, replicating uh, viral vectors. It's an interesting story. It's got an ethical tinge to it because one kind of virus that may be effective, it's effective in monkeys with SIV, is a virus that replicates. What's that mean? I, I better stop for a second and do this. Um, uh, <coughs> with HIV, you can't give people HIV. It would be wholly unethical to give them HIV. They might build up antibodies, but they're going to have HIV. So what do you do? You take hunks. You take pieces, a piece of DNA, perhaps a piece of envelope, perhaps some proteins, and you put them in a backpack on some other virus, a cold virus. Viruses you get every day. Uh, viruses, those viruses aren't going to kill you. They might not even make you sick. Uh, and they're going to carry some piece of the HIV into your body, which hopefully your body will react to and create immune responses, neutralizing antibodies, etc. So that virus, we have no vaccines for humans where we use a replicating virus. We use viruses that cannot reproduce to carry the vaccine hunks carry the hunks of what you're trying to get at into the body. Um, could we do it? It works with monkeys. Uh, maybe we could do it. We do do replicating viruses. Basically, you're giving somebody a lifetime infection of this vector, which may not hurt them, but that's pretty heavy-duty stuff to do. But we're, we're 
5 million people, 10 million people a year are dying. Should you try that? Well, regulatory bodies will decide these questions, but you know, they're ethical questions at the end of the day. They really are. They're not scientific questions. You need to be enough of a scientist to understand what the ethical question is. But uh, that's that. So I wasn't going to talk about that one, but there I did. Uh, and I shall not talk about this. So uh, let, let's do this. Let's take, um, let's take a few more minutes, if it's OK with you, Nancy, uh, to just maybe hop, skip, and a jump. We have talked about a few of these already. So uh, I've got two slides just sort of listing. The resource allocation issues, the macro issues, and the vaccine versus treatment issue we talked about. Where test when? Do you do, you do your clinical trials in Africa, or do you do them in Philadelphia? Um, we talked about that. Let's talk a little bit about clinical trials. This is, this is important and I think difficult for many people, and there are clearly ethical issues involved. How do you test for the efficacy of a vaccine to protect against HIV? Think about it for a minute. How do we test in science? We take one group that's very much like another group, and we give the one group the medicine, and we, give the, we don't give it to the other group. We give them a pill that looks just like it, a placebo. And then we see what happens. And we do it with enough people so that you can make some statistical judgments. Well, think of that in the case of HIV. You're going to a population, all of you people in the room, and you're saying, you know, we've got something here. We're pretty sure it's not going to hurt you because we've tested it that far. But we don't know whether it's going to work to prevent you getting HIV. <clears throat> I'm going to give it to half of you and not to the other half. You're all volunteers. You're all had informed consent on all this information, and you've consented. Uh, and uh, so they have. Well, um, you know, some of you, particularly in regions where there's a 37% infection rate, are going to get HIV, whether the vaccine works or doesn't work. If you're just the placebo group, you're going to get it. How that feel? Well, you know, these are populations. One side of it says, wow, that's, that's heavy stuff. Uh, should we really be doing that? Should we only do it with volunteers who are on death row in prisons or something? And who volunteer? Um, another part of it says, this is a high-risk population. It's composed of commercial sex workers in, on trucking routes in uh, uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, this is a group we know. We already have high infection rates. Of course, you're only testing people who are negative, because it wouldn't be any good to test people who are positive. So these people are diseased and HIV-free, uh, but they lead risky lives. They're prostitutes. Uh, they're uh, risky in other ways, uh, and um, uh, so they're a particularly apt group to test. Because, frankly, if we tested the people in this room, there's so few of you who are likely to be at risk that the numbers of cases is going to be so small that we would need a thousand rooms like this of people like you. Well, may maybe you're not as. In any event, uh, you, you, you really prefer high-risk groups because you need bigger numbers to get results that are meaningful unless you're going to have incredibly large populations, which is very expensive and very time-consuming to do your testing. Uh, and, and so these people, a, a significant number of them are going to get HIV. If you do your test right, you probably will help them protect themselves better than the people who are not in the clinical trial in the same population. So you counsel them on what causes HIV. You counsel them on non-risky behavior. You 
You do everything you can to try to have them lead lives that would prevent uh, HIV, and then you give half of them the, the vaccine and half of them the placebo. And that is generally felt to be an ethical way to run clinical trials. I am convinced myself that it is, but I cannot say to you that it's utterly free from argument. Uh, there's another set, and I'm going to touch on these two quickly. Uh, this court of couples, uh, people are living together, uh, <clears throat> more or less uh, uh, in monogamy, uh, and uh, who, where well, one of them is positive and one is negative. Same kind of thing, you counsel them, you teach them how to be safe in their sexual practices, but we know that a lot of them will not be. Uh, so uh, how do you feel about that one? Is that different? You can play with that. I'm not going to take time. Um, you can do it. Uh, there, are, there are special characteristics for the groups of uh, MSMs, men who have sex with men, and that's particularly difficult in Africa, where in some places there is horrendous discrimination and stigma. Uh, and even running a clinical trial in a group like that, which is often very eager to help, and which has a higher than uh, normal rate of infection, um, and therefore is good for purposes of running the trial, uh, but if they identify themselves, they may get beaten up, or worse. Uh, not everywhere in Africa. I, I don't want. I want to be very quick to say that. But certainly in some places, uh, some places everywhere. But I should say directly, some places in Africa, perhaps particularly so. So getting all that right and getting it right ethic ethically is uh, a real challenge. I'm going to go by for a minute. Um, uh, uh, replicating vectors we talked about just a little. Community uh, boards, um, advisory boards, are very important, but there are ethical questions about how you deal with community advisory boards in this setting. Um, let's suppose that circumcision or microbicides or PrEP, PrEP means simply giving antiretroviral therapy to you even when you know you're HIV negative. Uh, you don't need the drug uh, to treat, treat HIV because you don't have HIV. But if you give you the drug, if you do get it, it will keep the rate of uh, uh, the, the numbers of circulating viruses, vir virions in your body down. So you're less likely to uh, transmit. That's the theory. It probably is right. It's being tested now. Could be a good idea. Note what all of those would do. One of them would eliminate the epidemic. They would bring down the rate of transmission and therefore, and therefore uh, help keep the epidemic from being so rapidly spread. <clears throat> Makes it very hard to test. Because if those things work, and you're running a clinical trial, don't you have to give those people the means, the prep, the microbicide, the ability to get circumcised, uh, you do. I, I think that's pretty clear. People argue that. It seems to me you do. And, uh, you know, that makes it really hard to get good results in your clinical trial. So all these things you really need to do as a matter of ethics cut against what your scientific desire is. It's, it's a dangerous kind of uh, conflict. Um, I'm going to just talk about two and stop. Uh, which two? <laughs> um, I guess let me talk about intellectual property versus access for a minute. Uh, you, you've heard the arguments, I can't, I can't really have time to play them out. But when you're talking about drugs, for example, vaccine is a type of drug. Um, you want people to produce drugs. 
And if we, and we've found, historically at least, that the most effective engines for the production of the drugs is to, is to attach that to uh, those incentives in a, in a uh, free enterprise system, which causes people to want to produce the drugs so they make money. Uh, so you kind of want that engine working for you. And yet, how do they make money? Well, mostly they make money because they are awarded a monopoly by the government in the form of a patent. Monopoly is usually a bad word. It's not necessarily a bad word if you're talking about a patent. Uh, because there's a, a narrow period of time, at least in historical terms, uh, when you have a monopoly, while well, you have the patent, and you get monopoly profits. And that is an incentive for you to do the research that's very expensive and risky in the first place. That's the theory. Uh, I think it's actually right. Uh, so you want that. On the other hand, you don't want them making monopoly profits on my kid in the red coat in Namibia. He can't pay anything. So you've got to solve that problem. Largely with antiretrovirals, that's now been solved through a range of, an histor of historical things, another story. What we do um, is we, in our own labs, if it's our, our physicians doing the work, our scientists, well, we're a nonprofit. We're not, so we're not getting monopoly profits. We will make the we will make the drug available in the developing world, and uh, we will probably sell it to somebody uh, who will further sell it in the developed world, and will use the money we get for some other nonprofit related purpose. Um, we'll do deals with drug companies, biotechs, anybody who's doing interesting work, and say, uh, uh, Bob, you've got an interesting idea to advance the research, um, but it's too expensive and too risky for you to attract capital to do it. Tell you what, you put half of the scientists into the project, we we'll put half of the scientists, you put half the money, we we'll put the other half of the money, and here's the deal. If intellectual property, a vaccine or something intermediate comes out of it, um, you get all the profits and we don't take any profits. It's funny, when you say that in a meeting room with business people, uh, laugh isn't the word. Uh, uh, but it's true, because what we say is you have, one, you have one obligation. You must make that patent available for use for free, for use in the developing world. Uh, and they have to do that probably anyway, for other pressures. So they get all the developed world profits. We don't take any of them. And it's a good deal for everybody. But it's got to be worked out, because you've got to have access. You cannot invent a vaccine and not have people use it for 10 years of, of patent life. Uh, last thing, cultural sensitivity. I'll just tell you one little story. It's actually from my prior life, where we were trying to build models for treatment uh, algorithms in very poor places in Africa. And so we were, the, the clinicians from the local health uh, um, authorities were typically the doctors in the region, we'd work with them, and the whole, whatever health infrastructure there was. And that also went into that, which is not for now. Um, but we found that unless we made common calls, with the traditional healers, nothing was going to happen. Because with good programs, you could get all the people, a lot of the people, to come and be tested, to stay with the program, whether they were positive or negative, uh, to do the things they needed to do. Um, but you couldn't get them not to go to the traditional healer. Uh, so we made common calls with them. We didn't diss them. And you had people who were on the cutting edge of modern science devising those molecules I was showing you a minute ago, making common cause with people who f frequently were losing nostrums, which they certainly weren't proven, but they clearly had no value. I mean, I, I don't want to be unkind. 
but they had no value at all. And if people, uh, it didn't really matter most of the time that people took them, it wasn't going to hurt them, but, um, but, but what a strange combination, cultural sensitivity. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to stop. I, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, it's an interesting subject, but it's not for now. I am, I am required uh, to put this up by law. Uh, another story, but not an ethical one. Let's do Q&A. Thank you. I do apologize for the fire hose of information and the jumping around, but there is simply no way to cover uh, a lot of these things, and some of them really should be touched on. So with that, I'll take questions. Uh, there's one right there. The 33 million number that you cited yes. today, does that also include Uh, India is a very interesting place because the numbers have been fluctuating wide, wildly. We don't really know what the number is there. It's And at least my experience has been that the Chinese uh, in this era, in this regime, uh, set their mind to do something. They have both the power and uh, the process to get things done. And they seemed like they were really doing all the right things. I've heard that things are starting to turn a little bit worse and the numbers there, I don't know. Uh, yes, sir. Um, on one of the slides that you went by, uh, I happened to notice something that was on, on my mind. That had to do with the genetic variability of the HIV virus. Yes. And uh, the mutation rate being so high, given that, is it? Does that make it, I mean, how much more difficult does it make it? Well, it, it's, <laughs> well, people actually have quantified it, and I don't know that I can give you an answer in any, any numerical way. What we do know is that there are, with all mutations, there are conserved parts uh, uh, of, of the genome, uh, which, you, when you think about it, would almost have to be just to maintain some kind of consistency of basic structures, at least, uh, and uh, which gives us hope that we, we, if we can find antibodies that will go after the conserved parts, uh, that would appear in almost every variant, uh, then we could have a vaccine that would work uh, even with a lot of mutation. Um, it's a very significant genetic variation. It's as significant as it could be and still have an organism that survives. You have something like a fluke situation where you have to come up with multiple yeah, you, you raise a fascinating point, and there's a wonderful little factoid. I, one, one of the wonderful scientists in this field told me the other day. If you have a single individual human being who becomes HIV positive, that, after six years of being positive, that individual will have within his or her own body, in the population of viruses in the body, more genetic variation of that virus than there is genetic variation in a flu virus in all the world in one full season. Uh, not extraordinary. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. 
It is a no, completely different. It's just um, difference between plural and singular. A virion is one organism, tiny, tiny, tiny virus. Uh, with respect to the initial population death, I'm sorry. Is there an ethical difference in nature between dropping an atomic bomb and giving the HIV virus to human death? Well, I, I tell you what, and Nancy, it seems to me that by the end of this course, everybody in this room is going to be sufficiently attuned to ethical issues that they might be able to sink their teeth into that. Uh, I, I think it's a hard one. I'm, I have an immediate answer, uh, which is, yes, there is a difference. There is a difference. But it's, it, it's the kind of thought experiment that seems to me really worthwhile in, in ethics. I don't know that they're particularly related. At least I can't come up with it quickly. But the question is still a fair one. Yes? John, looking, looking at the ethical issues with regard to cultural diversity, those of us who know about research in this country realize that there is a meticulous adherence to specific Keep, keep your voice up a little for the people. Meticulous adherence to specific ethical principles. You have IRBs, institutional review boards, that evaluate protocols that make sure that informed consent is very meticulous actually don't know of kind of examples that may exist. Uh, certainly for us, for, for those I know who are doing uh, medical testing in the regions we're talking about, um, it's almost that you have to do, you not only have to do it more carefully and more punctiliously because of the difficulties posed by the populations, but um, it, it, you just have to go the extra mile all the time. And you can't, you cannot ethically change your standards to a lower standard. Um, now, I, I want to tell you that you can make an argument the other way on that. Um, and it's really hard, and it's really expensive. Um, when you go to the next village in in Namibia, in the in the a previous strip, about a 50% infection rates more poverty than you can imagine, um, but you may run into as many as 17 different languages, and very few people speaking the most common Western language in the region, which is in that area, English. Um, they just speak their own language. So you have to have people. Just think of the logistics of being sure that you had people who could even converse, let alone do it all in the right way, and monitor that. Uh, tough stuff, it really is. I don't see how you do it any different way. Some would argue that in a complete emergency, <coughs> triage is permissible. You have 50 people come into the ER in, in horrible shape from some terrible accident um, up the street here. And uh, you know, there's just not enough people. Maybe, maybe you can roust up all the docs in town fast enough to get them there and do things. But you probably have to do triage. You certainly have to do it on battlefields. Uh, and um, some would say, yeah, you, you, if in order to save Greater good for the greatest number, greatest good for the greatest number, uh, 
you really do have to change your standards. When there was probably a, a foolish thought, but a thought nonetheless that was real, that you could have an anthrax uh, problem in the United States or other parts of the world that was, was going to be of, of momentous size, those kinds of thoughts, I know, took place. But I don't see how you do it. I, way back up there, because I'm calling everybody here, because they're the ones I can see and they make noise. Thank you. Uh, clearly, the, the technical challenges with uh, vaccine are, are huge. And that is your initiative. But what about prevention? What about, you know, you're talking about the biggest bang to the buck in terms of um, programs to minimize or eliminate? Hugely important. It was hugely important, period. Uh, you know, but as I meant to say, if I didn't say it, because I try to say it every time, I submit that the world has a moral obligation to treat everyone who needs treatment in the meantime. And I believe the world has an obligation to have the most active and most effective prevention measures we can have in the meantime. But I can tell you, I actually, a whole lot of things in the world I don't know. But I really feel I do know enough to tell you with a high level of confidence that prevention alone, at its very best, and prevention and drugs alone, and, and together, with prevention are simply not going to end the epidemic in Africa, parts of India, and some other parts of the world. Uh, not all of Africa, but, but much of Africa. And, um, and they, of course, they haven't ended it in the United States. Uh, and, you know, it's a small group, and they get treated, but they're sick. So, yeah, I mean, got to do that. We've got to do it better than we're doing it. And you, and, you know, it's not either or. You, you, really, you really can do it. Uh, yes, sir. When we're talking about vaccine, when we're talking about the kind of vaccine that the many childhood diseases, if you're giving it well, you're covering it, or reversing something, given when you say something like a flu vaccine that you'd have to have every year, or you know, like um, the pneumonia vaccine, we have to get every five years. Where do you think of it? Yeah, uh, OK, quick answers. Uh, I do, I'm talking about a genuinely preventive vaccine. Now, a genuinely preventive vaccine sometimes needs a booster or a, a, a refresher, not a technical term, uh, many years later. Uh, if you've had, uh, well, I guess a bad example. Forget the example. Uh, it, you, you do need that. Um, but that's still a preventive vaccine. It prevents you from getting sick. There is a different kind of vaccine, which is what's called a therapeutic vaccine. And that's a vaccine you get after you're sick. So perhaps there's use at some point for a vaccine which um, is not preventive, but once you have HIV, can be given to you to stoke up, low word, uh, low phrase, your immune system so that you can help your body Keep the um, keep the virus down for longer periods of time, and you will not progress to AIDS as quickly. Now that that could really happen. That is plausible, and there are people who are trying to do that. Um, it, it would be a, it would be a wonderful thing. Uh, and indeed, some failed attempts at a preventive vaccine may end up being that. It, it's plausible. Uh, 
so uh, that's uh, another thing. You, you do have preventive vaccines in other, um, excuse me, therapeutic vaccines in other areas where people are sick and they get a vaccine that's been a lot of work trying to do that with cancer. Um, and it's a very similar thing. Yes, sir. Uh, the scale is just overwhelming <coughs> in the numbers. Um, so a two-part question. How well integrated is the quality of clinical trial uh, research that you've seen? And uh, is it a matter of the breadth of the data and, and integrating it is difficult, or the ethical considerations, whether they're political or economic or cultural, that keep certain research from being uh, shared? Um, it's reasonably well coordinated. Um, there's, there's a huge amount of um, sharing of information, much more so than almost any other area I can think of. There are some mechanisms that help that, but that's another story. Um, I think, as a general matter, the constraints on our ability to have a vaccine today and have one sooner probably are first idea constraints. We need. We have some particular scientific problems that need innovative approaches. We're trying to generate that iteration. Uh, we spent two days at the Institute for Advanced Study with uh, mostly mathematicians and physicists recently, uh, basically trying to teach them the heart of what was going on. It wasn't us, it was a range of people in the field. It was us, but others too. Uh, in order to get people who think entirely differently about other things, uh, but who think thoughtfully about the other things, maybe maybe come up with some ideas. We do that. That's just an example that happens to be local. We try to do that elsewhere. So, uh, uh, in general, I don't think idea constraints, money constraints, but it's not the biggest. We need money. If you sign your name somewhere, I may be after you. Uh, but um, that's, um, but those are probably more important than any of the things you speak of. 